I am going to dive right into my telling you about my book. It seems I'm not an economist after all. I'm an astrologer. So you can take uh, everything I say with uh, a grain of salt for that reason. Uh, why did I write it? Well, I basically woke up on November 9th, 2016 in shock. Uh, I think many people were surprised about the outcome of the election but I was really uh, stunned. And so then I began reading about all of the uh, reasons why we had had this outcome, and there was speculation about, well, it was Russia, or it was Comey, or it was that people didn't like Hillary, or she didn't run the best campaign. But I think in the end, the most important reason was because people really were frustrated and they wanted change. And they didn't want incremental change. They wanted big change. They wanted some China broken. I think they were right to be frustrated. We have got really serious problems in this country. And um, they've gone unaddressed for far too long. So that has created this pent-up demand for some uh, serious uh, movement in a new direction. So I view the election as a kind of wake-up call uh, to try even harder to do something about uh, the forgotten Americans. I'll come to them in a minute. But in a way that fits these trying times and, and the values of the electorate. I thought this conversation about first principles, get, get agreement on that, was really uh, important. Uh, let's begin uh, with the problem. Uh, let's see. Um, do have some slides here. And I think the problem, the big problem, as you all know, I don't have to tell you, is that we're very divided as a country. We're not just divided economically. We're divided politically and culturally as well. Uh, and I think the reason it's important to talk about all three and not just about the economics is because I think any solution, including on the economic divisions, is going to have to be very sensitive to where we are culturally and politically. I no longer think we can treat these issues in separate uh, silos. So what to do? On economics, I focus on work. Uh, that means jobs and wages. Uh, why do I focus on that? First of all, I think it's a core American value. We believe very strongly in the U.S. in work. Second, uh, the forgotten Americans, because I've gone out and talked to them, uh, as I'll tell you in a minute, it's what they want for themselves. You know, if you ask them, they say, really, jobs and wages is what they care about. And finally, I think work provides more than just income. It provides people with a sense of dignity and self-respect and being connected and contributing. On culture, I'm less optimistic. Uh, there isn't a lot that we can do. Uh, we've got huge divisions on how people feel about things like abortion, uh, guns, immigration, religion, and so forth. But I'm going to suggest at least two ways that we might... Um, at least mitigate the cultural divide. One is to focus, again, heavily on basic values that we can all agree to, the, the principles again. And the second uh, is to promote and encourage uh, universal national service. And I'll come back to that. Uh, politically, uh, one way to characterize my book is that it's an attempt, as Richard said, to move to the center. Uh, to marry red state values about education, about work, and about family to blue state policies that would actually help people in practical ways to achieve their own goals in each of those areas. Uh, moving to the center would furthermore, I think, uh, recognize, and this is very clear to me, that the electorate is a lot more moderate than the activist wings of both parties. Uh, we don't hear... Uh, about that uh, enough. Given hyperpolarization, we may also want, as the governor said, to rely more on local uh, and state governments, more on local community efforts, more on 
um, individuals and NGOs to improve people's lives. Now, I don't want to go quite as far as I felt they were going to think that that's all it's going to take, but I do think there's something uh, to that. Uh, simultaneously, we do need to reform our political institutions. I'm not going to have time to talk about them today. I'm hoping that my colleague Elaine might, but um, we've got to worry about dark money. We've got to worry about uh, voting and gerrymandering and that whole uh, list of political problems. Uh, now, I call my book The Forgotten Americans because that's what Trump called them, and they have indeed been left behind, and many of them supported him. So who are they? Well, there's no one really right uh, definition, but in my book, I first say, well, there are people that don't have four-year college degrees. I'm not too worried about them. Secondly, they are people who are in the bottom half of the income distribution, and so I'm taking out people who are doing just fine despite having the credential. And that leaves us about 38% of the working age population. When we look at their racial breakdown, a uh, little more than half of them are white and the rest are minority groups of various uh, types. Um, I think that we now can be ready to turn to their economic problems and I think the, this slide uh, basically tells you uh, what is in about three chapters of my book, uh, and I've just summarized it here because I think these trends are well known. Upward mobility is declining. Uh, inequality is at unprecedented levels. Uh, wages have stagnated, especially for the less educated, and labor force attachment is declining, especially uh, among uh, men. Uh, all of these problems have, uh, were exacerbated by the recession in 2008, but they've been around for far longer uh, than that. I would just stress that the problems are serious and that they have left a lot of people behind and that inequality is at virtually unprecedented levels. Now, although I'm focusing on economics, I don't want to leave the impression that what's been happening recently is just an economic story. It's also a story uh, about culture. And when government Kasich said it's some of both, economics and culture, I, I agree with that. I see uh, Bill Galston back there, and I think he's written a book that really gets at a lot of this. Um, some of you may have read these two specific books. Uh, they do an excellent job of describing the cultural issues ex uh, affecting just one subgroup of the forgotten Americans, although it's a big subgroup, and that is white, what's usually called the white working class. Uh, now, why have these two authors, and also myself, uh, spent so much time giving some attention to this group? And I think the central reason is because they voted overwhelmingly for Trump, about 78 percent of, excuse me, 67 percent of them voted for Trump, only 28 percent for Clinton. So if we want to understand the populist streak in our politics right now, we have to understand this group. Um, they feel disrespected. They don't like immigrants. They don't like trade. They think it's destroying their jobs. Uh, and they are uh, not happy about all the focus on the rights of women and minorities and the LGBTQ community. Now, it'd be easy to call them a bunch of deplorables, but as Hillary Clinton learned, that would be a mistake. They are a large and diverse group. Not all of them are nativist, misogynist, or racist. In fact, the data show that a significant number of them voted for Trump um, excuse me, voted for Obama before they voted for Trump. And the swing voters in this group, I think, are pretty focused on economic issues, not some of these more divisive cultural ones. So one lesson I drew from reading this kind of literature uh, is that it's a good idea to get out and actually talk to people because that's what these authors did. And so I decided to uh, do the same thing myself. Uh, and I hired a firm uh, and went to three communities, Syracuse, New York, Greensboro, North Carolina, and um, 
uh, St. Louis, Missouri. And I talked to the forgotten Americans defined in exactly the same way uh, as I define them in my book. Uh, this is what I learned from listening to them. Um, uh, this is actually, this is not what I learned from listening to them. This is the publication that talks about what I learned from listening to them that is just being released uh, today. Mark, thank you. Uh, and uh, these are some of the takeaways uh, from listening to these groups. Uh, first of all, they really do understand something that the governors were talking about, that people do need to be uh, better skilled than they are right now if they want to be uh, able to fit into today's labor market. But they're very skeptical of college. You know, as one person said, college, 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 you know, kind of very dismissively. And they, they see young people coming in with college degrees, and they don't think they really know that much, and they don't see them uh, being uh, all that productive as a result. The other thing they then say is it's not finding a job that's hard. Now, that may reflect where we are right now economically. It's the wages uh, and, to some extent, the benefits. Uh, there are plenty of low-wage jobs out there, but that's not what this group aspires to. Uh, they're very big on the idea of personal responsibility. Uh, they would not agree with what I hear from a lot of my liberal friends about it's the structure of the system that's systematically uh, making it impossible for them to get ahead. They don't think that at all. Uh, they want to be self-supporting. And they really feel not just underpaid, but also underappreciated, especially by their employers. Uh, this is an issue about respect and about feeling uh, as like you're part of a team, uh, as well as uh, your, your wage or your income level. Um, so let's move on then to... Um, this last point on this slide, which is they are enormously cynical about government. They think government doesn't work. They basically think it's a joke. I can't tell you how strong, strongly uh, they say that. And in case you think this is just a small sample, and it is a small sample, and it's not necessarily representative, here's the Pew data on trust in government, which is way down and is now around 20 percent and is even uh, lower for some parts of the government, especially the part here in Washington. Um, now, let me turn next to what we might do about the economic grievances of the forgotten Americans, focusing on uh, jobs and wages. I think the first thing we really need to do is to maintain full employment. Uh, I credit uh, Jared Bernstein for having made me so aware of how mu much difference that makes to this particular group. Unlike those of us who have professional uh, jobs, this group is very much affected by whether or not the economy is at full employment or not. Assuming we can maintain full employment, not easy, um, then the next point is that there are going to be lots of people who can't get jobs because they don't have the right qualifications or skills or because they live in the wrong places. And the governors talked about that, and I think the solution to that is the one that they emphasize. We really need a serious effort to retrain and help people relocate. Uh, Next thing is, I think we do need uh, a bold and very direct way that would boost take-home pay. Um, I liked uh, Governor Hickenlooper's ideas about this. I have a somewhat similar one, which is that we would give a tax credit uh, to everyone whose earnings are below about $40,000 a year, and that tax credit would offset their payroll taxes and bump up their take-home pay. I call it just a worker tax credit. It's similar to the EITC, but simpler, less error-prone, more marriage-friendly, and uh, more expandable to scale. I also think it would be politically popular. Uh, Harvard professor David Elwood used to say, if you work, you shouldn't be poor. That's a value statement. Uh, it resonated. 
Uh, President Clinton loved, liked it so much that in the uh, administration that he and I both served in, we actually extend, expanded um, the EITC. I'm looking at Alice because she helped with that too. Uh, so that it was true that you would not be work, you would not be poor if you worked full time. Uh, a worker tax credit would not only put more income in people's pockets, I think it would send a signal that government is now on your side. It would be a tax cut, essentially, for the bottom ranks, but tied to the value and dignity of work, and not a tax cut uh, once more for the wealthy. Now, it would be very expensive. I want to be open about that, something like a trillion dollars over a decade. Um, how would we pay for it? I think the best way would be by taxing uh, unearned wealth or very large uh, estates. I discovered uh, in the process of doing my research that the estate tax is actually um, a kind of a goose that lays a golden egg. Uh, and with, if we could just take the estate tax back to the parameters it had in about 2000, we could raise almost enough money to pay for my worker tax credit for everybody earning less than $40,000 a year. But as you know, right now, nobody pays a penny of estate tax um, unless they have more than $22 million uh, per couple. Um, finally, because I think government can't be the only uh, solution here, or perhaps even the major solution, given all of the distrust we've talked about, and the fact that all the growth in inequality, by the way, is due to the uh, fact that market incomes are more unequal than they used to. It doesn't have anything to do with our tax and transfer system. So one way to think about this is we have to then go and look at the income that is earned in the private sector. 85% uh, of uh, jobs and income are in that sector, and I think with a small nudge from the tax system, we could change the way corporations uh, treat their workers. We used to have unions to do that, but they've been seriously weakened. If they can be resurrected, I'm for that, but I'm dubious it's going to happen anytime soon. In the meantime, what I argue for is a more inclusive form of capitalism in which all stakeholders, especially workers, benefit when the economy is doing well. Um, and I think with the right tax incentives, we could nudge American businesses back into training their workers. They are, the amount of corporate training has gone down and also in sharing success with their workers through profit sharing or through employee ownership. There are companies that do that now. Almost everyone has heard of Patagonia or Ben & Jerry's, but many of you may not be aware that even the big three auto companies, as well as a lot of the airlines industry, is doing uh, this kind of profit sharing uh, as well. Now, a lot of people, including me as an economist, uh, worry that businesses aren't going to be competitive if they don't stay religiously focused on the bottom line, and I get that argument. But I did a lot of research on this, and frankly, I was surprised. It suggests that there is little, if any, trade-off uh, within reason between treating your workers well and making a profit. Uh, obviously, corporate America has to balance the interests of shareholders and those of workers, but all of the evidence suggests that right now they are overly focused on their shareholders and their quarterly profits. Uh, the new CEO of GE was quoted in the Wall Street Journal uh, yesterday that we get hired and paid a lot because we are responsible for thinking more long-term than anybody else that works for the company, but if we miss two of our quarterly profits targets, we're going to get fired. And he was kind of explaining the dilemma we face right now. I think this is all about recognizing that uh, operating a business is a team sport, and it would be like providing everyone, not just the top executives, uh, the equivalent of a performance-based stock option 
uh, when companies were doing well, and it might even boost flagging uh, rates of productivity growth. Finally, uh, to address our cultural discontents, our tribalism, I propose to expand or even make universal the idea of national service. Uh, President Kennedy famously said, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Under my version of national service, every young person would be expected to provide a year of service, either military or civilian. There are older, retired individuals who might want to participate as well. I add a new twist to this somewhat old idea by also suggesting that we ask American families all across the country to open their homes and host a young person during their year of service. Uh, my focus group participants, by the way, in the three cities I went to, they loved this idea when I talked about it. They really saw it as a way to reduce cultural gaps and help young people learn new skills while providing needed services at the community level and renewing a shared sense of identity uh, and pride in country. Uh, this idea has had bipartisan support in the past, but right now our current program is small and very underfunded. So let me conclude. Um, I have suggested a set of ideas that I believe have some merit but if my book does nothing but catalyze a better discussion about what we might do for the forgotten Americans, I will be happy. And I'm really looking forward to getting reactions from the terrific panel that is now going to talk some more about all of these issues. And I want to welcome them up to the stage, and especially uh, our moderator, Ruth Marcus, from the Washington Post. Hi, we're short on time, so I'm going to be super efficient here and start to talk while everybody's getting seated. Um, I'm Ruth Marcus from the Washington Post, and uh, I am neither an economist nor an astrologer, something even worse. I'm a journalist, <laughs> um, which means my prognostications are <laughs> even less likely to be taken seriously, um, but that's okay. I love coming to Brookings because it's a respite from, um, for me from the world of incessant tweets and um, hyper-partisanship. So being at Brookings in the world of ideas and being at Brookings in, um, the, with two of the um, most thoughtful and bipartisan governors around, um, for me, is like the journalistic equivalent of a spa day. So thank you. <laughs> thank you very much to Brookings. I appreciate that. But I also want to say... Um, We've spent so little time, really, recently. Um, we've spent so much time fighting, and we've spent so little time talking about policy uh, changes that could actually address the needs of these forgotten Americans. I think I need to start with a more challenging question than I intended to start with, and I'm going to direct my question, I think, first to Bill Crystal and then to Elaine K. Mark, um, which is this. Is our problem that we have a paucity of the right policy ideas, or is our problem that we just have a fundamentally broken political system that is incapable of dealing with um, even the smartest of ideas out there? Bill, that's a nice one for you. Great. Take it away. As the person who knows the least on this panel, I get to go first, I guess. Um, I mean, both, obviously. Um, and we have good policy ideas, but... That's what it is. If you came down from Mars and someone said, huge globalization, 20 years, really, I think more in scale and in, in quantity and maybe even qualitatively different than previous ways of globalization, you know, a billion workers coming into the US, to the world trading system, et cetera, uh, and breakthroughs in automation, obviously, especially in communications technology, that, again, I was a skeptic that it was that transformative, but I now think it's a pretty big deal, maybe industrial revolution size deal. And then you, just those two, sort of more on the economic front, 
then throw in a huge amount of cultural and social change, um, those are hard to deal with. We'll leave aside even the cultural stuff. Just, just the, it's not like it's so easy to know exactly how to help lower, less well-educated people's wages if you're introducing a huge number of low-wage uh, but pretty good workers into the global trading system. You could get rid of the global trading system and the free movement of capital, which would have huge costs in other ways. Uh, but So I, think, I do think the problems... I think the policy ideas are good, but the problems are probably of a higher scale or bigger magnitude, greater magnitude than maybe the equivalent problems were in 1960 when the equivalent good ideas were developed, which led to various social insurance programs or EITC and 20, 30 years later and so forth. Having said that, it's very clear the political system is broken. It magnifies divisions instead of moderating them. Political parties is the, I'll just say a word on this, is the easiest instance because I happen to vaguely look for 10 minutes at the sort of, or look, and I didn't really look at the political science literature. I looked at accounts of the political science literature on parties and the absolutely traditional account of parties, which is mostly correct, is they bring interest groups together, force them to compromise within parties, and then government force them to compromise between parties, and this is a way in which a huge, diverse, fractious society, one can get some progress and some consensus. It's very clear now that the party system, combined with the way Congress works, especially at the federal level, exacerbates divisions, leads to hyperpolarization and hyperpartisanship, not the opposite. Some of that may just be things that we don't quite control either, social economic sorting and so forth, but some of it is just due to the particular ways some of our institutions work. I do think the political reform agenda Fixing, we're not going to, fixing the, the right responses to automation and globalization, that's complicated and difficult and challenging. Fixing the political problems, the, the aspects of the system that are just making things worse, that should in principle be more doable, I think. Um, okay, so Elaine, is it? Yeah, I, th I Is it more doable? I think it's, I think it's more doable. Um, I want to focus in on something that Bell brought up. And, and Ruth, I want to tell you that we do do massages and facials upstairs. I knew that. Okay. I knew there was a secret space. <laughs> you, knew, you knew there was a secret space. Confirming everyone's <laughs> image of Brookings out there in America. <laughs> um, I, I, I want to focus on a subset of the political problem, one that I'm very familiar with, which is which Bell mentioned and showed this graph of trust in government. Part of the problem is that there's been, the zeitgeist says that the government does everything wrong. It, the fact couldn't be further from the truth. There are millions of people every month who get their social security check. There are millions of people every month whose medic, who medical bills get paid by Medi Medicare. The government is actually working. And if you take that trust number and break it apart and you ask people, how do you like Medicare? They love Medicare. <laughs> Ask people how they love their so how they like Social Security. They love Social Security. Ask people how they love the United States military. They love it. Ask people how you love the post office. How they like the post office. They like the post office. Okay. So this trust in government is a weird thing, which we've spent a lot of time breaking down um, in a project I did at the Kennedy School some years ago. And what it boils down to is there is some sense that what they do in Washington we don't quite understand. And the way I've always explained it to my students is Washington is a great big ATM machine. You just go like this and money goes. And where does it go? It goes to the states and to the localities. Now, what happens every time we have a government shutdown is people get it. They say, oh, all this government that I do like, it comes from Washington. What a surprise. And then, of course, they quickly forget because everybody spends all their time criticizing Washington. So I think we've got a big problem here in looking at the system and at the government and convincing Americans that actually, you know what, you're getting pretty damn good value for your dollar. I'm uh, sorry, are you saying that what we have here is a messaging failure? I think we have a big messaging failure when it comes to what the federal government does. I think we absolutely do. And I can point to that graph Bell showed. Um, between 1994 and 2000, the trust in government numbers went up steadily for those six years. Then there's a peak in 2001, that's the 9-11, and then they, go, they slide back down. 
What was going on then? Bill Clinton was telling, and Al Gore were telling people that they were reinventing government. They were fixing it. They were breaking ashtrays. They were talking about all the silly stuff. They were getting rid of it, etc. This is not an insoluble problem, but it is a problem that has to be addressed if you want to get to any of the good ideas that are in Bell's book. You have to convince people that there is some level of competence, and I think you have to do that in a way that we've ne- that Bill Clinton tried briefly in his administration, and nobody's tried before or since. All right, so let's, um, I'll play economist here and we'll assume we've fixed government, trust in government and insoluble divisions between the political parties. So let's move on to ideas, at least temporarily. Um, Eric and then Jared, um, I'm giving you a magic wand and I'm allowing you um, the one best idea. Though I will actually give you in your wand, you can have the um, ability to wave it back at me and to say, that's a really stupid question, Ruth, because there is no one best idea or else it would have already been done and what we need are a series of micro or interventions. Um, But but I'm asking you my question and you you can um, uh, turn it back on me if you like. Fair enough. Thank you. Um, Well, first, it's great to be here. I I really appreciate the opportunity to be here with this uh, panel. And a part of this conversation, naturally, I received the book last week. So I said, oh, my God, I have a week to read the book and get through this and be prepared for this panel. And, of course, I started with the conclusion and then went to the intro. Um, and as I was turning the pages, I kept thinking, oh, this is a great idea. Let me, let me, let me read more of this. And, you know, before I, I knew it, there was no page left behind uh, and forgotten, right? I, I went right through it because a lot of the things, the proposals really do ring true to either proposals that have helped, you know, all Americans um, over time or some pieces of that that we were building on in some important ways uh, that, I, that I think were crucial um, to cover. So I appreciated the, the breadth. I also have to say that for, coming from the civil rights community, I, I've appreciated the way uh, that Bell really included the notion of race uh, and other communities um, in the book. We have seen many books come out about inequality and forgotten Americans where it's kind of in the intro. Yes, racism matters, but we're moving on. Um, and, and But this, I think, did justice to um, at least communicating that this is important, an important part of our understanding about what's what's happening. And I say that because... That's important to thinking through how we move from this point forward, you know, given the way that our politics have aligned with race um, in the way that we think about solutions um, and working together. So the proposal that was important to me was the National Service proposal. It was the one proposal that brought together the notion of humanizing communities as well as trying to create um, a benefit. And I say that because... I firmly believe at this stage in, in what we're seeing that racial resentment and racial animus and identity, white identity, the country's identity, are far more important uh, in factoring into our politics than perhaps we give it credit. Um, and, and, and that hinders our ability to come together around a common economic agenda. And I think that's important for us to to talk about, and I think that's important for us to address. The one missing dimension uh, that I felt was important to lift up was um, not immigration, but immigrants, right? And the fact that we have five to six million U.S. American children that have an undocumented parent in their household. That is the future of our country, and they're living in fear. And the current system that, that we have in place is undermining the parents' ability to work, undermining the kids' ability to have education uh, and pursue that, and threatening to separate them from their families and their parents. Right? That, that's happening right now right? as we think about the future. So I think there needs to be more conversation about that because our policy system and our political system is not, has not been created to digest those issues properly. The, the, uh, the thing that I think we could all agree is that if tomorrow we introduced every single proposal in this book, minutes later there would be anti-immigrant amendments 
that people would see attached to every one of those proposals. You, you just can't get around that. That's just kind of the, the reality. So the one that sticks out for me is the one that addresses the humanizing of segments of our community with the interests of the country. And that's the only way I believe we're going to be able to move forward together. All right. Now, Jared, what's your idea? Well, first of all, uh, thank you, Ruth, and, and, and thank you, Bell, for uh, inviting me and for writing such a great book. Uh, people sometimes compliment me on my ability to write clearly about complex economics, and then I read Bell, and I, I how, see how much further I have to go. Uh, it really, uh, and, and so, so the clarity, but, but the other... An astrologist. Right, maybe that's it. Um, and the other part of the, the book that I really commend to you is you really see someone who's got, you know, a very big brain but an equally big heart struggling with uh, very hard questions. And, and that just uh, really comes out, uh, off of the page, uh, Bell's earnestness in trying to think about these problems. And there are a lot of Tony economists at her level that don't bother doing that. So I am endlessly um, uh, thankful for, for her work in, the, in that regard. Um, so let me be somewhat uncharacteristically a bit more positive than some of the uh, uh, other voices we've heard today. And starting with some of the, um, so, some of the things that uh, Bill was just talking about, Bill to my left, um, was talking about uh, regarding trade and technology. And then I'll wind up uh, and try and answer your question. Um, so if the notion is that uh, the pace at which labor-saving technology is displacing workers in the American labor force, and that the pressures of trade are uh, also um, uh, having those kinds of impacts due to import competition, it's kind of hard to square with the economy and the labor market that we see uh, right now in front of us. We have an unemployment rate that's almost at a 50-year low. 3.7%. 3.7%. We're creating jobs at a pace that most economists didn't think was uh, plausible at this uh, late stage in a, an economic expansion. By that, I just mean it's a, an older expansion. I'm not saying that it's, it's going to end uh, anytime soon because economists can't really predict recessions and expansions don't really die of old age, so we don't know. But it is year nine. Uh, and, uh, and yet, there's more capacity out there, more room to run, as we sometimes hear Fed chairs say, which actually has bearing on where we're about to go next. Um, uh, the problem is, is job quality, and this actually comes right out, out, of, out of Bell's work. Uh, people were saying we, we didn't have uh, so much trouble finding a job, but it was the quality of that job. And there I, I take your point about the downward pressure that trade puts on wages. Well, that's something that can handily be addressed by policy, and I'll leave it. I'm not, I'm, uh, unlike many others on the panel, including Bell, I'm not really talking about the politics right now. Obviously, uh, without them, we get nowhere. I totally, I'm not dismissing that. I'm just saying there are people here more qualified to talk about the politics. But here, the policy, uh, as Ruth asked, um, uh, whether it's a minimum wage, uh, expanded earned income credit, Bell has an idea to build on top of that, a worker's credit, uh, those are all uh, plausible ways to improve uh, the quality of jobs uh, when the quantity is strong. And then you might say, well, wait a second, do we have enough income to do something like that? Well, we have more wealth per capita than uh, we've ever had. Uh, it's just extremely concentrated at the top of the scale. So, yes, there will have to be some type of redistribution to make that occur, and that is part of Bell's uh, uh, solutions as well. In terms of the policies, well, I, I, I've, I've already been tagged as, as, as a, uh, an advocate of full employment, and I I very happily and willingly wear that, that tag. And I think maintaining full employment is key. As I said, we're just now at 3.7%, almost a full percentage point below where the Federal Reserve tells us is the lowest unemployment rate sustainable with stable prices. So the natural rate of unemployment, clearly uh, they pegged that too high. So here we are uh, in, in, in territory we haven't been at for for decades, and we haven't seen that much wage pressure. Well, we're starting to see a bit more now. And my prediction, and you can um, uh, write me nasty tweets if I'm wrong, is that uh, over the next uh, couple of quarters, we're nasty going... Nasty tweets? Yeah, can you imagine? Hard to yeah, believe. It's hard, hard to imagine. Um, I do have a policy. The minute somebody sends me a nasty tweet, I, I block them. So one strike and you're out is the way I, I play it. But that, that's neither here nor there. Hey, that must explain yeah. something. Yeah, my followers are dwindling. But anyway, um, 
the, 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 my point is that I do believe we're going to start seeing uh, some, uh, some real wage gains uh, in, in coming quarters. So I think full employment really does work, and, and I think there are monetary and fiscal policies that can help maintain that. In the interest of time, I won't speak to them. Uh, I'll just leave, uh, finish with this. Um, Bell talks about the importance of a, a subsidized employment program. I very much uh, endorse that and would underscore the point that there are numerous ideas that have now been written into legislation on Capitol Hill, all Democrats, none of them going anywhere anytime soon, uh, but they exist on a continuum from a, a very uh, mildly interventionist idea, which Bell puts in her book, to a guaranteed job that Richard asked about earlier uh, that is at the other end of the continuum. I think there's actually very good ideas along that continuum. I'd probably put myself more in the middle of it where Bell is on the on the uh, on the less interventionist side, without uh, without going all the way to the guaranteed jobs, but I think that that uh, is my policy solution: maintain full employment. But because there are places and people that full employment doesn't reach, you need a subsidized uh, employment program as well. So I want to kind of encourage everybody to jump into the fray here, but I didn't want to um, pigeonhole Lane and Bill as the um, political types with a, no policy brains, because they are policy brains as well. So, um, Bell, do you want to say something really briefly about what you've heard so far, and then maybe um, no, Elaine no, and Bill I, no, can I think, jump uh, in? On... I think we should, con- okay. we should continue. All right. Uh, Elaine, um, you're wa- you have the wand. Yeah, I think there you go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think that the, I want to say two things about the politics of this, okay? First of all... I asked you about policy. I was giving you the policy opportunity. The policy? Yeah. Oh, I didn't hear you. No, but you can do you. politics, oh, oh, whichever, whichever well, you think. Let me start is- with policy. Let me start with policy then. One of the things I love about Bell's book is that she understands and, and emphasizes the value of work. I really dislike all these policy proposals to have a guaranteed income. It would so undermine our democracy. It would so create two, we worry about class. Imagine the class system that would develop with those who work and those who don't. That would be just awful. And I think that what Bell hit on here is a sort of core essential value that sometimes my party loses sight of, which is the the psychological value of work and how important that is. And so I think that that's, that's absolutely critical. And supporting work through um, worker tax credits, the EITC, I mean, look, the EITC was the biggest increase in poverty spending in the century, <laughs> okay, in the century. Nobody gets that. Right? No, absolutely nobody gets that. It started out as a Republican idea. Um, the New Democrats stole it, <laughs> okay, blew it up, m- increased it a lot. And now the Republicans have turned against it, right? The Republicans have turned against the ITC because they say, oh, well, the people don't have a stake in the system if they don't pay income taxes. And there's a lot of people who are not paying income taxes. So they actually go back and forth. This year's CEA report actually yeah. calls for an expansion of the oh, EITC. Yeah. Oh, a little a small one. A small one. Oh well oh that's good to know. Yeah. In in any event, I think that the emphasis on work is critical and we we have to keep our eye on that ball in all policy development because it is such a core value and get away from the extreme and and Bell also touches on this the ex- extreme redistributionist side of it that doesn't work in America i don't know how many times democrats have to try it to and fail <laughs> to see that it just doesn't work and so i think those are two they're they're almost value and, and messaging issues that should be at the core of the policy so, Elaine, the eitc redistributes about 70 billion dollars a year from high income people to low income people so why is that okay with you you know, in other words, I, well, no, I mean by extreme, you know, like, what is it you're against? What, what, what I'm against, I feel what like I'm, I should just get out of the way of the, the best. No. <laughs> there's no debate. There's no debate that's nastier oh, between a new uh, Democrat no. and an old Democrat, you know, and I and I always enjoy them personally. So I feel like I'm not at all being na- I'm not at all being I'm nasty. just teasing you. Jan. I think I'm, she <laughs> mean, I think you mean something different. Well, no, what I mean is the EITC is about work. It's grounded in work. And I think that that's the core value that I'm trying to get at here. And I think that's what Bell talks about in the book. 
I'll just say a word on the policy thing, and then we can get back to the class warfare versus non-class warfare stuff and everything. I mean, I look, I actually agree with Jared in some certain respects and uh, um, in many respects, but I still think the relative disadvantaging of less well-educated workers in America is something that's very hard to see how you fix with you know, mo moderate or incremental policy proposals. You can massively, you can do as much with the EITC as you can do. You still then have the problem of less participation in the workforce, which doesn't really help those. So the EITC doesn't help the, unless it drags them in, you could argue maybe, but it doesn't directly help those who have uh, st stopped participating in the workforce and which presumably aren't captured in the unemployment numbers. So I, I think it just is a big structural challenge, which requires fresh thinking. And to some respect, it may be something that, you know, one goes to as a society, as an economy for a decade or two. It's easy for me to say this, and it sounds heartless. No politician will put it this way. But, you know, there are just macro, you know, huge economic trends that one can't fully compensate for um, or deal with. But I agree with Jared in this way, but coming at it from almost the opposite. In a weird way, I wonder, isn't it easier to do big things than small things in public policy? So, I mean, you would, I think... I don't know. I, Ask President Obama and Oh, well, but he found this, too, I think, in some ways, which is... I'm putting, I'll, put it, I'll put it in a... I mean, there's a Keynesian side of this, which is, look, these, it's, in a way, easier to have higher economic growth than to figure out how to allocate the rewards of economic growth in some micro, clever, targeted way. That does assume government working better than I think it often does work, and it forgets about all the unanticipated consequences of various government policies. And then from a sort of, let's say, conservative, or I don't know what you call it, Hayekian point of view, I just have a skepticism that government knows how to do these things that well. Whereas, I, so this on the Clinton years, I, it wasn't messaging. I mean, what the Clinton years, people had more trust in government because their incomes were going up from 95 to 2000. They started to lose trust in government when their income stopped going up, middle class incomes, I think, I mean, didn't they, they kind of interrupted the secular stagnation or decline that has been going on for three decades or so. So I regard that as just a policy triumph of Clinton. It was not loved by the left. It was not loved by the right. It was a pretty conventional, I think you could argue, economic policy. James Carville complained that the bond market was running the country, but it turned out that actually having responsible uh, debt and deficit policies was a good idea. It could accommodate, obviously, some policy initiatives like EITC. You get a huge cold, end of Cold War dividend, which helps you. And then you get, you know, a tech bubble, and it gets a little complicated. But still, I think it's a policy success, which suggests that, I mean, I wonder if the system is now too broken to respond to policy successes. That would be an interesting question, or not, or whether it can't produce those kinds of policy successes. But I think that's actually encouraging in the sense that people aren't just foolish. You know, they, they really became unhappy again with government when government stopped performing well. So I don't quite agree that government's doing such a great job. I mean, I do think, I mean, Bush and Obama, they were, I mean, 08, I'll, and I'll say against my own interests, some of the foreign policy failures of Bush, the crash of 07, 08, that was not supposed to happen. We had worked that all out. Alan Greenspan, Ben Bernanke, I know Ben Bernanke is a sainted figure and he's probably sitting here or something, but you know, if anyone looked at the Fed, and I shouldn't say this with economists, if anyone actually looked at the Fed minutes from like 06, 07, 08, they did not know, what, understand what was going on. So I do not have such faith that we can you know, figure these things out so wonderfully. But I think the citizenry had in a way a sensible response, which was these experts do not know as much as they claim to know about what they're talking about. Now, the response they seized upon is very damaging, in my view, to the country and conceivably to the global economy. And in that respect, final point, I'm sort of slightly hostile to those who we elites are out of touch, we have to get in touch, we have to listen to people. I'm all for that. But if listening to people means actually pursuing policies that make them worse off, which is, in my view, would be some of the policies on trade, or scapegoating immigrants, or not dealing humanely and seriously with the people who are already here, or in my view, actually cutting back on more immigration of certain kinds, which would probably be a big help for economic growth in a macro level, which would be very good for the country. I'm not interested in sort of, I understand in politics you have to accommodate, but I think it's a little unfair to accuse politicians of, like, they try to find the right policy. The Republicans, I will say, the establishment Republicans, whom everyone derides, hung kind of, hung on to free trade when no one else was doing it, supported Obama's free trade uh, uh, messages, tried to pass with the Democrats, obviously, an immigration bill in 2013. And, you know, so they tried in a way to hang on to what they thought were reasonable policies. It turned out that they were unpopular politically, but it's a little hard to criticize them for trying to do what they thought was the kind of right thing for the country. So, 
good. I was wanted to bring you in here. Yeah, I'm not going to react to all of that, but but just to say a, a couple of things that, um, and there was a lot I agreed with in what you said, but a, a couple of things that I think that um, Bell's book does touch on is that we did just do something big with the tax cut uh, that we passed, and and that was that was enormously tilted in one direction, and as as long as we continue on that kind of trajectory. We're going to have longer term, but it's uh, unpo- challenges. but it's unpopular, it's popular. and yes, the Democrats absolutely. might actually run on that a little more. I, I yes, think here I'm yes. probably with Jared. You know, this is actually a good issue for the Democrats, <laughs> as is health care. I mean, they should they sort of should get back to basics on the left and stop, you know, thinking that every culture war fight is an automatic victory for them. <laughs> but, but a couple of things that, that were in the book that I, I also thought were important was one is that a part of the solution going forward has to be the private sector and thinking about how you can uh, use the tax code or the corporate tax code to realign incentives and think about training and investments uh, I thought was, was quite intuitive and, and makes a lot of sense as we think about the future. The other was we have to deal with the estate tax, right, because what is passing on non-worked <laughs> earnings to the next generation over and over and over again, uh, over generations and the accumulation of that, um, over time, how do we get more uh, of that to invest in the places that we think is important? So I thought those, those were two important contributions to this part of the conversation I, did, I didn't want to uh, leave behind. You know, it's interesting. You've identified two two particular pieces of what Bell's talked about. Um, one is the notion of national service, and the other is the estate tax and um, uh, regaining revenue from the estate tax. And I have to say that um, I, while I find myself agreeing with both of those instincts and think that America would be a better country if – those solutions were implemented. I'm also not at all convinced, other than being able to use that estate tax revenue for a better purpose, that either of those in and of themselves would address some of the fundamental forgotten American issues that we've been talking about. Please discuss. <laughs> Jared, um, Elaine? Well, I find myself having some difficulty wrapping my head around the conversation uh, because it, it, it all sounds so um, large and insolvable in a way. You have to get the politics right. You have to get the communication right. But you can't you have to, as Bill said, if you, you don't want to listen to people who have bad ideas, you want to listen to their good ideas. And how much do we really understand about people anyway when we go out and talk to them for you know a couple of weeks or a few focus groups? So I think the best thing to do is to get down to basics. And what was a very elegant aspect of Bell's book is she identifies the basics as, as family education and work. And I got to say, that just makes a lot of sense to me. And of those three basics, Bell, you'll correct me if I'm wrong. You have the author right here, so <laughs> she can do that. Um, I think work gets a little more heavily weighted of those three. In the short run. In the short run, okay. And so we need to so, – so, so that maybe makes the question here um, uh, something you can maybe think about and deal with, which is that you know, there are places, uh, and they tend to be as far as you can imagine from – uh, you know, the corner where you can get a, a, a latte macchiato, uh, the, where, where labor demand isn't that strong, even at low unemployment. So I'm talking about rural parts of America. Uh, I'm talking about uh, parts of America that used to have a manufacturing base that has been significantly di- diminished. And here is where lots of economists who used to think about the solution for that kind of a problem was for people to move somewhere else. You know, a politician would never tell you this. You know, go to some other district. But the economist would say, pick up and pick up and go to the city. That's and and in fact, geographical mobility has diminished. Bell points this out in her book, and so you can't say that. You have to bring more economic activity to people, and I actually think that could be done through a pretty aggressive subsidized employment program. In fact, I would go further than Bell's. She, in my view, kind of nips a little bit around the edges by just targeting the people who are most disadvantaged. I would argue that there are, uh, there are places in this country that have great needs, infrastructure needs, uh, human uh, uh, child care and, and, and educational needs, and there just isn't enough investment income, isn't enough economic activity to pay for that. And so, yeah, if you wanted to do it in, in a way that was that Ruth Mar- make Ruth Marcus happy and have it be 
uh, deficit neutral. <laughs> I knew that was coming. Uh, then you'd have to raise some, raise some revenue through some part of the tax code, and people like to pick on the wealth tax because it's so egregiously unfair and you know, put me down as an advocate of that as well. But uh, however you do it, or even if you have to, God forbid, put it on the, on the deficit, I think that's the way to go. I think we should bring more economic activity to places where it's not reaching, and we should be pretty content that it is reaching a lot of other places as we speak. Maybe I could ask a question we're gonna, about... We're, we're going to lightning round ourselves okay. here, and we're going to end the lightning round with a last word from Bill. Okay, so I'll just ask, you can have, in your last word, you can answer that. So I think you've emphasized as much as anyone, family, education, and work, and the formulations, of Ron, you and Ron, and about you know getting out of high school and not having kids and, and uh, staying out of jail and so forth, and I uh, totally agree with that. But the book, of course, is heavy on the work side because family has been... A, dealt with by other people analytically, and B, is no. extremely hard. Yes, and it's extremely hard. The book is going to be on education. Right. Well, so but it's, family is extremely hard to deal with for a gov- in a free society with a government. And education shouldn't, well, who knows if it should or shouldn't be, has been extremely hard to deal with education reform in a serious way for 30, 40 years. So work seems like the one one has the biggest lever on because it's more responsive, presumably, to much more direct things government is used to doing, like EITC and, and minimum wage and whatever, and deregulation, if you want to look at the, you know, encouraging the, the people who are employing the workers and so forth. But how, this is an honest question, how much is the work lever worth compared to the other two? And I think if Charles Murray or Bob Putnam would sit, were sitting here, they would like the book and they would be friendly to it, but they would say, compared to these other forces, um, you know, you're sort of having you're, you're just this limited re- reward for the, what, all doing all the, even if the political system were fixed and we did all these good things, how much really would it change the situation we're looking at out there? Uh, very quickly, uh, you know, what I would say to this is, no, we're not going to solve, we can't solve everything. We cannot solve cultural problems from the government. We can't solve long-term structural problems from the government. What can we do? We can do, do the sort of things that are in Bell's book. And t- in order to do those, though, we, we need to get to a point where the population says, yeah, government can do some things. And I think that's very important, and that's been a major impediment. There are things the government can do. And we need to cross that barrier before we can get to then some realistic policy. Uh, Well, to answer Bill's question about work, education, and family, in the short run, if you're talking about what would do the most to help help the most people um, over a few years' time, work is it. But if you're talking long-term, then a better education system and more uh, healthy, stronger families might be more important. I actually believe it depends upon the time frame where you come out. All right. Uh, I'm sorry. Can I, can I just um, really echo something that Eric brought up that I th- I'm worried is getting lost here? The Tax Cut Act of 2017 gave away, uh, you know, we can debate the number, but you know, at least a trillion and probably more like $2 trillion. And we didn't get anything back for it. Uh, It was a giveaway. Now, I understand there are economists who believe that they will, money will be used to uh, increase investment, increase productivity, and eventually you'll see a wage effect. Uh, We had a wonderful uh, paper here written by one of our best conservative and one of our best liberal economists trying to figure out what the long-term impact over the next 10 years that tax bill would be. The impact on growth was tiny, and they agreed to that. This is not a liberal uh, conservative thing. Uh, And to me, the issue here is not just, you know, where are we going to get the money and how are we going to fix our politics? It's couldn't we be a little more sensible about cost-benefit here? This had a huge cost and a very uncertain benefit. And to go back to Eric's point, um, we really do need to nudge the private sector in some new directions. We could have used that money. We could now amend this bill we could replace, we could repeal and replace it even. Uh, I hate to use that phrase, but we could. Uh, with, and use that money to help workers uh, uh, have more of a stake 
in the success of the economy. Uh, so I'm very big on that idea, and I think it hasn't been talked about enough. So I think couldn't we all be a little more sensible here is the overarching title of the Isabel Sawhill trilogy. Um, so we'll be back in a few years to talk about education. Um, I really look forward to it. Thank you to Brookings, to Bell, to this very distinguished panel, and to the audience. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.